So let's talk now about how nutrition, health, and cultural competence all fit together. In recent years, the significance of culturally based food habits on health and diets has been recognized, and the need for intercultural competencies in the areas of research, assessment, counseling, and education is extremely important. The Kampinhag Bakot model of competence outlines a process for cultural competency in healthcare and stresses cultural awareness, knowledge, skill, practical encounters, and a desire to make these changes. Dr. Kampinha Bakot is the president and founder of Transcultural Care Associates, a private consultation service that focuses on clinical, administrative, research, and educational issues in transcultural health care and mental health. As we move toward the future, we all need to make a move toward cultural competence, especially those of us who are in the healthcare field, and that includes many of the students in this class. This means that we need to improve our language skills, gain managerial expertise, and take leadership. These are all necessary in order to encourage healthy lifestyle changes and serve hard-to-reach places. We can also affect change by becoming involved in public policy. The growing need for cultural competence is evident in current demographic trends. The U.S. is rapidly moving towards cultural plurality, where no single ethnic group will be a majority. This chart shows projected U.S. population growth by the year 2050. I apologize that it is difficult to differentiate the colors, but hopefully you can see that total population growth is expected to be a little less than 50%, while the growth of all races except non-Hispanic whites far surpasses this. Unfortunately, health is not currently enjoyed equally by all of us in the U.S. Disparities, which are differences or inequalities, are found in mortality rates, chronic disease incidents, and access to care. This, of course, can lead to poor health status and is directly linked to poverty, low educational attainment, and immigration status. Please take the time to read the short article entitled, Does Hunger Cause Obesity? on the bottom of page 22 in your text. In a multicultural environment, it is imperative that we understand the relationships between ethnic food choices and ethnic health disparities. Ethnicity can be a significant factor in how certain diseases are developed, experienced, and ultimately resolved. There are differences in rates of diseases and death in cultural groups, which can be seen in this chart. Let's look at diabetes, for example, which is about halfway down the page. As you can see, Those who are of American Indian, Black, or Hispanic ethnicity experience much higher rates of diabetes than do those of Asian ethnicity. Some American Indian populations, such as the Pima in Arizona, experience almost a 50% diabetes rate in their adult population. Rates of hypertension are located about one-third of the way down on this chart. Once again, we can see that the same ethnic groups have higher rates with the disease being especially high in our black population. Please take the time to also read through the PowerPoints on both diabetes mellitus and health disparities in the U.S. They are both located in the Chapter 1 module as well. There are some basic things to remember when interacting with different ethnicities, even if you are new to the process. Even obtaining basic nutritional information may have cultural implications. For example, you shouldn't just assume that the person follows a typical breakfast, lunch, and dinner pattern, nor should you assume that certain foods constitute a meal. I generally start by asking my clients, regardless of ethnicity, what is the first time you typically eat each day? Then I will ask them to explain what foods and beverages they generally choose. I will then ask them, when is the next time that you eat during the day? Portion sizes should be determined by using the hand or some generally well-known items, such as a baseball, since many may not grasp the concept of American standard measurements yet. Terminology can also be a pitfall, since words can have different meanings. Above all, we need to avoid stereotyping and forming ethnocentric assumptions about people. You should also do your best to become a skilled observer when interacting with client groups visiting homes, neighborhoods, or markets. When evaluating the diet, it should always be within the context of the culture. 
Food habits should be classified according to their nutritional impact. With that said, you will find that there will be food used that has positive health consequences that should be encouraged. There will be neutral food behaviors with neither adverse nor beneficial effects on nutritional status. There will be food habits unclassified due to insufficient culturally specific information. And there will be food behaviors with demonstrable harmful effects on health that should be repatterned. When diet remodification is necessary, it should be attempted in partnership with the client and culturally based food habits should be respected. I'd like to end by touching on a concept that is becoming more and more evident in the U.S. today, and that is the concept of the American paradox. Food terminology is often used to describe cultural pluralism. You have probably heard the term melting pot used in reference to American society in the past. This implies a blending of different ethnic, religious, and regional groups to produce a smooth, uniform identity. The term stew has also been used, but implies a cooking of various populations to a bland sameness with just a touch of cultural identity. The term tossed salad may actually be the term that works best, since it allows, allows for maintenance of cultural identity, randomly mixed in a delicious, complementary blend. The American paradox is similar to the omnivore's paradox, but implies that even though foods from throughout the world are increasingly available and often affordable, there is still a need for consistency and conservatism. For example, I enjoy going to Chili's for a fajita once in a while, but I prefer that the spices be toned down some to fit my less adventurous spice taste buds. The American omnivore's paradox may be an even more accurate description. Because we live in a country settled by immigrants, perhaps we have a propensity towards variety and trying new cuisines. Yet we also have a drive towards keeping our original cultural food traditions intact. As the author of our text says, it is the unexpected and exciting ways in which the familiar and the new are combined that make the study of food habits in the U.S. such a pleasurable challenge.